So I want to begin first uh, by finishing up the previous chapter. Uh, that is this one. There was a bit here that we left off that we didn't talk about, that last section on relative moral principles. Um, that, uh, this is why that the screen is on this right now. Uh, I want to cover this relatively quickly, I don't know, the first 10, 15 minutes or so, and then we'll move on to uh, actually talking about chapter four. Um, so he goes into the question, uh, or perhaps the objection to, what about principles, like ethical or moral principles, that seem to be relative to the person or relative to the situation? Because it seems like, well, what I ought to do depends a lot on things like who I am, where I am, what I'm doing, that kind of thing. I've used the example before that, you know, if I'm, if, if I make the decision to fill this with coffee, that decision might turn out to be different depending on who I am and what I'm doing right now. So there's coffee in here right now. Why might I have, can you think of different circumstances or anything like that that would have given me a good reason to fill this with something other than coffee? Sure. Maybe I, uh, I mean, I don't know if I'd put a beer in a container like this, but let's say I would go for it and let's give it a try. Um, why, do I, why would I not do that now, but might do that under other circumstances? No, you, you just want regular energy. The other time it may be that you want to flush something out of your mind while you're about to do a heinous crime. Okay, fair enough. So I'm, I'm preparing to commit a heinous crime and I would like some, uh, some fortification of the nerves to do so. Um, so I'm, uh, and so, you know, a, um, a drink of alcohol or two can help with that sort of thing. Now, everything about that is a bad idea and is ethically wrong, but let's set that aside. The circumstances still within that framework, if, well, maybe it's, let's, if we set aside about to commit a heinous crime and just stick with about to do something very stressful, how about that? That, that's it's a broader category of the narrower particular thing, <laughs> okay? Um, one that doesn't have the same moral implication. The reason I want to set it aside is because what, what, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what is the right and wrong course of action. And if my end, the, the, the end I have in mind is committing a heinous crime, no means that I use to achieve that end will be morally good, right? Regardless of it's coffee or alcohol or, or a gun or a knife or whatever, yeah. Right. How about then uh, climbing up the tower to install a new antenna? Okay, yeah, fine. There we go. Now we can question about whether you should be drinking and doing that sort of thing. Um, but let's just say, given, given what I know about my own alcohol tolerance, that one drink will relax me more than it will hinder me for performing such a task. That's a fairly reasonable assumption. Now might be true for some people and it might not be true for others. That's important to note because for some people, having a drink before climbing something tall to install an antenna on top of something is a very bad idea because it'll affect their coordination, which they dramatically need for such things. But if I am particularly prone to nerves, if I get really nervous about things like this, but I have a reasonably good alcohol tolerance and this will relax me enough to help me accomplish this goal, without, I'm not encouraging any of this behavior, by the way, just to clarify, because you look, you look worried, understandably. But supposing that I know enough about my own alcohol tolerances and my own temperament and stuff like that to determine that this is actually going to aid me in pursuing the course of action that I'm trying to pursue, that might be perfectly appropriate. However, it would not be perfectly appropriate to do so, say, in the context of teaching in a classroom, right? in part because of just professional standards. I, I, by, by teaching this class, I agree to abide by certain professional standards, which include not drinking on the job, right? Um, and putting coffee in here is, uh, is contributing to my ability to teach this class and my subsequent classes more effectively and efficiently and coherently and all that. Okay, so what just happened there could be described in a few different ways. You can look at this as seeing that there are different, uh, different moral rules that might apply to different people in different situations. Like 
don't drink alcohol is a perfectly coherent moral rule for some people under certain circumstances. Recovering alcoholics, for example, I think I've used this example in class before, right? <clears throat> if you're a recovering alcoholic, you definitely shouldn't drink at all. But for other people, that's not a particularly good rule. It might be excessive. Uh, it might even be detrimental under some circumstances. It might, it might impede uh, social relationships and things like that. So it might not be a good rule for others. Simpler still, uh, a very straightforward example. I have three classes today. This is the first. I have two more that are right after this. I've got a very short break in between each of them. What that means is that I have a limited amount of time between classes. Would it surprise you to find out that I don't drink coffee, I don't have this full of coffee in my third class? Why not? Why would that not surprise you? Because that's too much coffee. One might think, but you also don't know my tolerances yeah. concerning caffeine. I have what's called an addiction. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm joking a little bit, but not, not as much as I'd like to be. Um, but that is, that is possibility, right? So, so if I filled this up, this class, and then I filled it up before the second class, and then I filled it up before the third class, and then I went home and had another one, even for me, that might be too much. Because that's eight cups, of, this is a two cup coffee cup. That would be eight cups of coffee in, over the course of an afternoon. And that is assuming that I didn't have a cup of coffee before I left for work this morning. I didn't. But it's possible, right? I could have. Right. If I were thoroughly indulging this addiction of mine. So that's one, that's one thing. Now, if I drink this cup over the course of this class and the next class, that's like three hours worth. And then I fill it up again for, for my third class. And then drink the rest on the way home. That's a little more reasonable. It's still kind of a lot. It's still kind of a lot, but I'm an academic, and this is, this is kind of what we do, is we, we drink way too much coffee. I'm, I'm not only an academic, but I'm also a parent of three young children. We drink too much coffee. It's what we do under both of those circumstances. So, <laughs> so that's part of the reason, though, is, you know what? Refilling my coffee cup before each of my classes might be a little much. I, I have talked about my high school teacher who drank between 30 and 60 cups of black coffee every day, right? Have I talked? Yeah. Oh, no? OK. He had a pot of coffee in the back of the classroom that he would periodically throughout class would refill his cup and keep drinking as he talked and lectured. And then between classes would refill the coffee pot. And it was a big, it was one of these, not, I mean, he's still alive, shockingly. He also, like, smoked, like, six packs a day or so. Ooh, uh, I'm sorry. That, that just gave cancer. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think he, he even got any sort of cancer. He did not. Uh, what generation was he from? Um, I don't know exactly. At this, I think he's in his late 60s now, so he was in his 50s at the time. Probably early 50s. I don't know. Not sure. I know he. Uh, I know he was. Uh, I know he was a soldier in the Korean War. So he was oh, old enough for that. He was a frontline soldier in the Korean War. He was uh, in the CIA bomb squad for a few years. Um, He's, he, uh, he had a PhD, like I think at least two master's degrees and God knows how many bachelor's degrees. He was an impressive person. He had a lot of accomplishments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Slowly though. Yeah. Well, also, <laughs> it was a great teacher. So it, it worked somehow. I'm not gonna emulate the behavior, but you know. I like the coffee. I'm not a, not a cigarette smoker really. I smoke a pipe on occasion, but I'm also giving it up for Lent, which has not been much of a challenge, which is good news in terms of, you know, withdrawals or addictions or anything. I've given, by contrast, a few years ago, I gave up coffee for Lent, and it was not fair to the people around me. I was not, I was not a kind individual during that. Anyway, th that's how I know I have a problem, but I manage it. Anyway, I digress. Uh, the point being is, the... The moral conclusions about what should I be drinking right now might vary depending on me and depending on what I'm doing right now. Later in the day, I'm going to refill this with water. And that's a good decision for a lot of reasons. One, I don't want to drink too much coffee. 
two, I don't have time. For me to go and refill this coffee from somewhere would mean I'd have to have a coffee maker somewhere nearby. And realistically, the nearest place that I could do that is either going over to Benedict's, which is quite the trip for a 10 minute break between classes, or over to, uh, over to the adjunct office, which is over in St. Edwards, which is also quite the trip for a 10 minute break between classes. Right. But then there's a line and then it takes time Either way, it's impractical and I'd probably wind up being late. And so it's, it's contrary to my other obligations. I should not do so. By contrast, if I just go rinse this out and fill it with water over the water fountain over there, I can be back with plenty of time. So I, there are lots of reasons for me to drink coffee from this right now, and lots of reasons for me to drink water from this later. That might look like our moral principles of what we ought to do might differ based on who we are or what we're doing. But McInerney is going to argue that that is not quite the case. Rather, it isn't our moral principles that differ, but merely their application. The same principles or the same general rules might apply radically differently to different particular situations. And this is where he brings up that shotgun example, which is just spectacular. Um, I really like this because this is an example that goes back at least to Plato. Um, no, obviously he wasn't talking about a shotgun, but he was talking about lending someone your spear. Bless you. Um, Plato is talking about gave basically the exact same example with less detail and talking about a spear instead of a shotgun. But it's basically the same thing. It's just I love McInerney's version just because it's so richly detailed. Um, so you borrowed your neighbor's shotgun. When you return from the hunt, you're told by several people whose word you have no reason to doubt that the neighbor whose shotgun you have used to bag your quota of mallards has in the interim been announcing to the skies that at the first opportunity he means to blast you to kingdom come. Already right there, there's a ton of embedded information here. Now again, I, I talked about this in, back in chapter one uh, with the carpet tax example as well. There is no... There's no abstract philosophical reason for this much detail in his situations, in his thought experiments. But he does it for, I think, two reasons. One, because it's memorable. This is a lot more memorable than asking the question, well, if, you, if someone lent you a weapon and then demanded it back and, uh, with the implication that they planned to use it to kill you, would you do it? I mean, yeah, you can summarize these two paragraphs into a sentence, but why would you do that? That's quite forgettable, and there isn't, it, it doesn't feel real. And then the other aspect of this is that, like we've been talking about before as well, ethical situations are embedded within reality. They have details like this. This is a situation that could happen. This is a, this is a uh, maybe odd and outlandish situation, but it's the kind of thing which, which isn't in any way sort of abstract or anonymized. This is a story of what could and would happen. And then you have to figure out, well, under these particular circumstances, what should I do? Because any situation when you're trying to figure out what should I do, it has particular circumstances like this. So why do you think that the guy is going to kill you? Well, a bunch of people told me, and I have no reason to doubt. Uh, I have no reason to doubt what they have to say. Uh, he's been shouting to Kingdom Come about it, which, I mean, they would have reason to know, and I would have reason to trust them. Okay, so I've used this, I've used this shotgun. What, why is that important? Why is it important that I've just got, got home from using the shotgun? Doesn't seem that important, but. Well, he, he just got back from the hunt. Mm -hmm. He's not anticipating anything, but he does know that the neighbor could come at any time. Yeah, right, so I'm, I'm just coming home. I've been out all day, I've been busy, and as he, can, as he goes on to say, you arrive home, take off your boots, mix a toddy, and are about to sink into the comfort of a chair. You're at home to relax. You're not, you know, preparing for a confrontation. Which winds up being morally significant here because what you're, you, are, you are not, one, assuming, uh, assuming that there is conflict approaching and preparing for it. And so you're not thinking in a, in a manner involving conflict. But then also, um, this is the kind of situation where, uh, where Maybe if you had prepared for it, you may have acted differently. Like if you know that somebody's going to come demand a shotgun back, and 
is going to be quite angry about it and going to want to kill you, kill you about something that you probably didn't do, throwing leaves onto his lawn, apparently. You might have acted differently. <clears throat> you might have, um, I don't know, prepared said shotgun to intimidate him into backing down. Or, if you're wanting to be a little less confrontational and more honest about it, you might have misplaced or left the shotgun somewhere else where you would have to give him time to cool off before retrieving it to give it back to him. But that's not what happened. Right? What happened was you arrived home, you heard that there was this conflict brewing, and then you sit down and say, all right, I'll deal with that when it comes up, which is a fairly realistic response to this sort of thing. But now given that response, now we have this, this, this apparent moral dilemma. So there on the porch with eyes aflame stands your neighbor. I want my shotgun, he roars. Now, if there should flutter across your mind the thought that after all, the shotgun is his, he lent it to me, and I should return it to him on demand, the thought will surely be followed by the realization that it is unwise to hand over to a man who has threatened your life the means to carry out the threat, no matter that the means are his property. So you have this conflict going on. It's his shotgun. He wants it back. I owe it back to him. I should return it. Then again, he's going to try and kill me with it, or at least that's the implication. It's a reasonable assumption given his behavior and what he's been saying. So McInerney asks, is this mere rationalization a self-serving consideration? So are you just trying to get out of doing the right thing because it'll have nasty consequences for you? Well, right. He doesn't think so. That said, our moral principle seems to be return what you borrow, right? Pay back your debts. What you owe, you ought to give back. This is a demand of justice. And so justice is the fundamental moral principle here. We ought to give to each what they are owed. We ought to do what is right in terms of, uh, in terms of interpersonal relationships and exchange, broadly speaking. OK. If that is the case, and that usually means to give back what you have borrowed or to give people what you owe them, and you owe this guy his shotgun back, it seems like under most circumstances that, yeah, you, you ought to do so. When he asks for it back, you ought to give it to him back. What's different about these circumstances, and why does it matter? Yeah, so what? Not to dismiss the point, but, but why does that matter? That, that, is, that does matter, but why? Why does it matter? Give it a try. No, 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 no. Um, if someone is, uh, if someone is, for example, threatening to kill you if you don't uh, murder ten million civilians, should you do it? No, no. I mean, if it comes down to it. And, th and the, the nefarious villain kills you, and in so doing, you don't murder 10 million civilians, fine. Yeah, you've saved 10 million people's lives. Innocent people, by the way. Then, well, maybe they're going to do it, but they shouldn't. Maybe he'll eventually find a coward. Somebody who would be willing to save their life, their, their own life, in exchange for mass murder. Now, we'll, we'll talk about this particular little bit, both later today, a little, and then more later on, uh, both when we come back from break, and then another week or so later when we talk about the Milgram experiments, and all kinds of things like this. This is, a, this is gonna be an ongoing topic for discussion. But the point being is that we, we clearly think, and I think correctly we think, that we should not do something heinously wrong to avoid something bad happening to us. Uh, it is, as Socrates put this in, in the Apology, in his, in his um, sort of defense, his failed defense uh, before he was executed, uh, it, is, uh, it is better to suffer injustice than to commit it. So just because there is a conflict brewing, and this guy is you know, planning to shoot you with his shotgun that he's lent you, 
does not mean that you should do any, everything and anything to prevent him from doing so. Because there are some things you could do to prevent him from doing so, which would themselves be wrong. Even more wrong. Do you like killing him? That might be fine, depending on the circumstances. Right? If someone's trying to kill you unjustly and you have to kill them in response in order to stop them from doing that, that might be fine. Again, circumstances might, might affect that a little bit. But in general, that's self-defense. But that would be different from, like, out, a wildly outlandish example, because I can't, I'm not, as, I'm not as good at thinking of vaguely realistic, detailed scenarios like McInerney is. That would be very different from, okay, fine, you need to defend yourself from him, and so you wind up killing him in the struggle. That's very different from, you need to defend yourself from him, and so you wind up, like, driving your truck through a crowd to run him over. Right? That's different, and it's different because what you're doing in the latter case is you're causing undue harm to lots of other people, innocent people, uninvolved innocent people, rather than simply doing the, the one thing that you might need to do in order to resolve the situation. Okay. So under the circumstances, should you give the, should you give the shotgun back to your neighbor who intends to kill you? McInerney is going to argue that no, of course you shouldn't. That's ridiculous. I mean, our, our sort of instinct, our, our sort of moral instincts say, no, you shouldn't. But there is a concern that maybe that's just my cowardice talking and I'm just trying to avoid conflict. Or I'm just trying to, you know, save, to save my own skin under any conditions, even if it might do the wrong thing. But no, he's going to, he's going to explore and uh, explain later on here in the next paragraph. He says, well, think about it. If in different circumstances you were to return the borrowed gun, it would, be to, uh, it would be to serve the end of justice. So what he means there is that the reason you would return the gun is because, because it is just. It is the just and right thing to do, right? to serve the ends of justice. So he asks, would that end be served if in these circumstances you returned the shotgun? Surely not. You would be aiding and abetting someone in the perpetration of an injustice, namely blasting innocent you to kingdom come. You'd be, a, you'd be an accessory to murder. Your own murder, but murder nonetheless. Okay, so let's, let's, let's run through the situation, right? Your neighbor is at the door, he's yelling at you, I want my shotgun back, and I intend to shoot you in the face with it. And you say, ah, here you are, sir, enjoy your shotgun, and okay. then he shoots you with it. You have helped him commit murder, right? Uh, say, yeah, maybe, or said, um, calm down, come back tomorrow. I need to clean it first. Something. Unload it before you give it back to him. What is this? Anything. Something that will not be directly aiding and abetting him at committing murder. Because, again, what you're trying to do is you're trying to do justice. You're trying to do something just. Is it just to aid someone in committing murder? No. And so even if returning his property to him would under normal circumstances be the just thing to do, under these particular circumstances, the principle of justice determines that you should not aid him in killing you, assuming that you are innocent. Or even, I mean, under the circumstances, even assuming that maybe he's right, maybe you have been, uh, as he says, um, he has come upon piles of dead leaves at the end of his garden and is convinced that you have been pitching detritus over the fence and onto his property, right? On the assumption that McInerney gives us, he assumes that, well, I haven't actually been doing that. Maybe it's been the wind, maybe it's been somebody else, whatever. Maybe it's been wild animals. It doesn't matter. I haven't been doing it. I'm innocent of the matter. But let's suppose that you have been doing so. Let's suppose that it's been a particularly heavy autumn and there's been a great deal of leaf fall on both of your yards and you thought, I've run out of trash bags to put these into, and, I, uh, and my compost pile is quite full. I'm going to put them over the fence. Don't say you haven't done this before. You haven't put leaf litter of any sort over a fence at any point, really? No. You people are better than me. <laughs> but you're not better than me. Thank you. <laughs> See, I... To be fair, I, I live, there's a, uh, there's a, there's like a retention pond lake out back on the golf course and I just kind of pitch things over that edge and uh, not like trash, but like leaf litter and biodegradable stuff because there's a big hill down there and it'll go away. Yes, I, 
hello, I have done this. <laughs> I, I'm, I will do it with, with biodegradable food waste, too, like banana peels and such. I'll just check over the back fence and things, and it's fine. But if someone got particularly mad at me about that, or suppose instead of the back fence, I did it over the side fence into the neighbor's yard because I got the directions mixed up. Or I thought, oh God, I can't, bother. I can't be bothered to walk all the way back to that side of the yard. I'm just going to dump this leaf litter over the side in, into my neighbor's yard. And my, and my wonderful neighbor had come up to me, I'm going to kill you for that. That would not be justified either. So your innocence in this matter isn't particularly relevant. Again, why McInerney brings this up is because, one, to make matters less complicated. Because if you haven't done anything wrong at all, and it's entirely based upon a mistake on your neighbor's part, it makes the ethics of the situation much clearer. But then also, um, because he has to give an answer one way or the other, you either did it or you didn't. And so it's, it's either going to be true or false. And again, the fine details of the situation are real. They matter because there really, they're, they're really could be a situation like this. So do we all get why, under circumstances like this, it, it, it isn't that moral principles are changing. It's just the applicability. And he adds at the end here, I can't find the quote. I'm looking on one page in particular, and I can't find it. Um, this is where, basically, he points out that um, the principle of justice that would ordinarily justify the, the, the rule, return what you borrow, would be the same principle, the exact same principle, which would in this case justify an exception to it. It is, I hate to use dumb cliches like this, but it's the exception that proves the rule. It is the exception which is justified by the actual rule itself. Act justly, do what one ought to in terms of one's, one's uh, social relationships and debts and obligations. In this case, one's ob one of one's obligations is don't, don't be an accessory to murder. That's a great obligation. Right? Very simple and very straightforward, mostly achievable. And that obligation is an obligation of justice, just like give back what, you're, uh, give back what you've borrowed, except that give back what you've borrowed, well, unless it's going to be categorically unjust to do so, in which case it don't, because in this case it wouldn't be. It would be categorically unjust. So justice is the, the highest level moral principle at play here. So the question is, what is the just thing to do? Is it repaying what I have, uh, giving back or repaying what I've borrowed? Well, normally it would be, but in this case, no, because it would be unjust to do so in this particular concrete circumstance. So it's not that the moral principle is itself relative, its application is situational. Because we start, again, this is going back to that model we've been talking about all semester. This, we have these big abstract moral principles. The, this is our, these are our starting points for ethics. And then we have to examine the details of the situation and then filter that principle through the details to find a particular outcome or a particular judgment or a particular course of action. And that's going to depend upon both. Like, what are the abstract moral principles, which we can figure out from the outset? And then it's going to depend on the details of the situation, and that's going to give us a particular answer.